Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started because I know it's early release and some of you guys got to go pick up kiddos. So thanks for being flexible this morning. All right, so last week we spent a lot of time talking about Jesus, right? Who he is, his deity, his rank, his role, his power, his responsibility, his inheritance. And we saw Paul throw down the winning hand in declaring and proclaiming Christ's preeminence. And so that's, that's not a title given to Jesus. It's not an office that was imparted to him. It is who he is, preeminent, supreme. That's who Jesus is. So this week, Paul is going to move into a description now of who he is, the apostle himself, and the work that he's been given um, from God himself. And while this passage in scripture is very, very particular to Paul's ministry, um, it's important for us as well. And it's important for us because we, of course, need to know who Jesus is. We need to know his role, his life. But you know what? We need to know our role as well. Our role as the church, our ministry, our part in this divine story. Everything hinges on Jesus. And that includes us, his body, his church, and the work that has been discharged to us from God to do. So today we're going to look at five functions or, or areas of Paul's ministry that the body of Christ has now taken up as we continue the work of the Lord. So if you want to turn to Colossians 1, we're going to start in verse 24. This reads, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. So function number one, suffering. Don't everybody cheer at once, right? You guys, Paul states that his work is to suffer for the sake of the church and to fill up in his flesh what is lacking in Christ's affliction. So if any of you guys have watched the news recently, you know that suffering is very much alive today. I mean, my goodness, I was standing on this stage two weeks ago while the shooting in Parkland, Florida was going on. You guys, we are surrounded by suffering, sickness, violence, exploitation, death, everywhere it's everywhere and in googling the word of suff- in googling the word suffering um, I came across just a, a list of um, news articles that had suffering in the in the title and, and these are just a couple more American teenagers suffering from anxiety disorders now than ever the science of suffering how kids are inheriting their parents trauma suffering and the causes of physical pain how we should respond to images of suffering you guys it's everywhere. And I read, I read just all of these, I didn't even read the articles, but just the titles alone. I read them and you know what my reaction was? It was this. Ugh. It's hopelessness. It's hopelessness. Why? Because that is the pattern of the world with regard to suffering. It's hopeless. It's fatalistic. It's worthless. It's pointless and a thing to be avoided at all costs. But if it befalls you, sorry. So why, and better yet, how did Paul manage to rejoice in his sufferings, which as you read in your homework this week were extensive. This was a suffering servant of Christ, right? He was beaten, he was hungry, he was tired, he'd been shipwrecked, he was poor. He was stoned. He was in danger. He was even writing this letter to the Colossians from prison. In a few years, he was going to be martyred. I mean, this was a man who knew suffering. So let's, let's start with the why. Why Paul rejoiced in his sufferings? Well, Paul longed to be like Christ. And friends, hear me that as much suffering as Paul endured for the sake of the gospel, no one has suffered more than Jesus himself. No one has suffered more than our Savior. And we we read kind of a list of this in in Isaiah 53. Jesus was despised. He was rejected. He was afflicted. He was oppressed. He was crushed. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. No one understands suffering more than Jesus. But let's not leave out key parts of the scripture in Isaiah 53. 
he was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And by his wounds or by his stripes, we are healed. You see, Christ's sufferings were for something. Suffering for. They weren't worthless, his sufferings. They weren't pointless. They were for something. Well, what were they for? You guys, they were for our hope. They were to give us hope. You guys, the gospel, it is how Christ endured. We read in Hebrews 12, 2, 12, 2. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Suffering for, that's the why. That is the very important why. For the joy, for the joy of seeing restoration for the joy of seeing people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, for the joy of Jesus himself taking his rightful place at the right hand of God the Father until the day he comes back. Suffering for. That's why Paul could rejoice in his sufferings. Because like Jesus, he knew it was for something better. His sufferings, Paul's, meant the church's growth, advancement, and spread. And Paul, sweet Paul, who celebrated everything, ever the celebrator, Rejoiced in it and through it. So let's answer the how question next. How could he rejoice in his sufferings? Well, he could he could because he understood the Lord's work in his sufferings. Turn, if you have your Bibles, to Romans 5. Romans is another letter that Paul wrote, potentially the last one he wrote, at the very, very end of his life while he's in prison in Rome after Colossians. And he has this to say in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You guys, Paul is suggesting something really, really interesting here. I noted earlier that suffering, the suffering that we see around us, the suffering according to this world, the pattern of suffering that we see in this world is resultant hopelessness. Paul is saying the exact opposite. That for those of us who are under grace, who are in Jesus Christ, we don't suffer hopelessly like the world does. When we suffer, it produces the exact opposite, hope. We get hope when we suffer. Oh, you guys, that is exactly what we want. And we, we talked about this in week two. What springs from hope? Faith and love. You guys, our suffering is for hope, which results in faith, in love, and ultimately produces joy. Hope gives way to joy. And we need all of that if we're going to make the gospel known to a world that is suffering hopelessly. We don't have to. We suffer in order to let them know of the hope of Jesus Christ. So what does this mean for us? First, we read in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who are determined to live a godly and devoted life in Christ Jesus will be made to suffer because of their religious stand. Friends, suffering is a part of the Christian life. It's a part of the Christian life. But we don't suffer needlessly because our suffering produces endurance, which produces character, which produces hope. And that hope, that glorious hope, is exactly what we need to preach the gospel to our world. Second thing this means for us, when Paul speaks of what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, he is not, hear me, he is not suggesting that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough, okay? Jesus suffered enough. And when he uttered with his last breath, it is done, he was declaring that he had suffered for the sins of the world. It is done. Paul is suggesting something different. He is suggesting that the afflictions of Jesus Christ were the proving ground of the gospel going out. That the afflictions and the sufferings that experienced in Jesus' body were the proving ground of the gospel going out. Well, guys, guess what? We're now the body of Christ. 
So in order for the gospel to go out, the body of Christ is going to suffer. You guys, we are going to fill up, or in the Greek, what that means is undertake to our part or share what suffering needs to be done in order to accomplish the work of the gospel. Suffering is key to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. But you guys, we suffer for. We suffer for the gospel going out. We suffer for people coming to know the Lord, and we can rejoice in it and through it. I want to tell you a story that this that illustrates this really well. There's a notable uh, Christian um, from China. His name is Watchman, or was Watchman Nee. He's, he's dead now. And Watchman Nee is a remarkable man who had an incredible story of preaching the gospel under the heavy hand of um, Chairman Mao and the Cultural Revolution when, when they were trying to stamp out Christianity. And there's a story told of Watchman Nee that he preached a sermon about suffering one time. And I want to share what he preached with you because it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So in the sermon, he had a glass jar. And with a malevolent, malevolent look on his face, he took that glass jar and he threw it into the ground, shattering it into a thousand pieces. Then he took his foot and he began grinding the shards of glass into the dirt. And he'd kick it and spread it all around and try and make this glass into a powder. And then with a look of satisfaction, he exited the stage. But he came back a minute later with a look of complete and total fear. And he began trying to scoop up all these shards and put it back together to collect them. But when you take your foot and grind glass shards into dirt, you can never get it out, right? When glass is in dirt, it is in dirt. And so he, he did his best. and His hands were ripped and bleeding. And he was trying to get it all together. And when he couldn't, he just dropped what was left, and in resignation, he walked off. You guys, this is what he was saying. That glass jar, that was the gospel. That was the body of Christ. That was the church in China. And he himself was acting like the government. Really, he himself was acting like the enemy. And it sought to destroy Christianity in China. And it did it by shattering. But instead of destruction, what happened? The thing shattered into a thousand pieces, and it went everywhere in China. This, um, this breaking caused the church to splinter all over the country. And as the government tried to grind it out, all they did was grind Christianity and Christians and the gospel deeper and deeper into the fabric of China. And when they realized what they had done and they tried to collect it back up together, there was no way they could do it. So all they could do was give up and give in. And you guys, today, the Christian church in China spreads like wildfire. It is vibrant. They are sending out missionaries all over the world. And let me tell you what, the Chinese people are working to bring Jesus back. You guys, that is what suffering does. It's not something to be avoided if we're called to it because of what the Lord uses it for. It is suffering for. It is suffering to see Jesus and his gospel made known. It is suffering to see Christianity in the very fabric and dirt of our land. It is suffering for Christ's return. You guys, it's a gift. We suffer for it's for the body. It's for the church. It's for Jesus to come back. That's how we can rejoice in it and through it. So the second function of Paul's ministry in this text, making the word of God fully known. Verse 25 through 27 of Colossians 1 says this, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, Paul established verses ago, like we studied last week, that Christ is the head of the church. Paul is not the head of the church or the redeemer of the church, but as verse 25 says, he is a minister according to the stewardship. Let me pause there and talk about this word stewardship. This word means management or oversight of a household. And what Paul is saying is that God's administrative oversight was basically given to Paul so that Paul could manage the affairs of the church's household or the household of faith. And this was given to him from God to make the word of God fully known. 
Okay, so Paul right here in this, uh, in this set of verses begins his direct frontal assault on the teachings of the Gnostics. You remember the Gnostics were claiming that in order to achieve salvation, you had to ascend to some higher plane of, of understanding through mysticism, mystical experience. And what this meant for the poor people of Colossae was that they were in this place of not ever exactly knowing if they were saved. So Paul, in essence, says, I'm going to tell you what this mystery is so there's no question. So the Gnostics, and more than that, the enemy cannot fool you. This mystery, hidden for ages, but now revealed to the saints or God's people, is that Jesus Christ came and suffered in his body for the sins of Israel. But who else did he suffer for? For the Gentiles. You guys, the mystery was that Jesus has made a way for everyone. That means we, us, Gentiles, we're in now. Ephesians 3, 6 says it this way. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. You guys, we're in. That's it. That's the mystery. And the Colossians actually already knew this. They had already been brought the message. They had already been sealed in the Holy Spirit. Christ in them was in them the hope of glory. You guys, Paul was coming against a lie, a lie of the Gnostics. Because this mystery had been revealed. Epaphras had made it known. And the riches, their justification, their sanctification, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, the gifts, eternal life, that was all theirs in Christ Jesus, and it was done. So what does this mean for us today? This ministry, this making the word of God fully known is for us today. Why? Because the enemy is still lying. And he will use any road or any byway or any avenue or any boulevard to cause people to turn from the living God and to all manner of other things as long as they're not headed in the right direction. Right? I said this the first week, that the, the best way to identify a lie is to already know what's true. So as we seek to spread the gospel, to bring people into our family, we must do so with intent to make the word of God fully known. My husband and I moved to San Antonio back in 2003 um, when GPS systems and navigation systems were still kind of new. Not everybody had cell phones yet. We didn't have cell phones yet at that point in time. And um, we moved into a new house in a new housing development. So brand new homes, brand new housing development, brand new street. And when you move into a brand new house, even though the house is built, you're still lacking some things. Like we didn't have any window treatments. We didn't have a water softener or, or a yard or any of that stuff. So we began calling contractors Um, to come out and give us estimates on all of this stuff. And invariably something would happen. They would put in our address into their GPS, and the GPS would get them to the outskirts of our zip code, and then it would leave them with this, address not found, cannot find address. And that's a problem when you are naked and you need to cover up your windows so people can't see inside, right? You see, they could get close, these contractors, but they couldn't get all the way. Why? Because the way wasn't fully known to their GPS and therefore to them. And let me tell you what, when it comes to contractors getting to your house or the gospel going out, getting close isn't good enough. We have to make the way fully known. We have to lay out the way and the truth and the life so people can get all the way because part way ain't going to do it. The vicinity is not good enough. We must make it fully known so that people can arrive at the destination as partakers of the promise of Jesus Christ through the gospel. We have to make it fully known. The third function of Paul's ministry is is that of the herald, proclaiming, warning, and teaching. And I want to talk about these a little bit. Verse 28, chapter 1 reads, Him we proclaim, warning everyone, or every man, as you read in your homework, and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So let's look at these individually a little bit. Proclaiming. Him we proclaim. I actually prefer the King James version of this scripture, which reads, whom we proclaim. Whom. You see, the Gnostics were philosophizers, and they were coming against a philosophy and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I remember way back from when I was in college in Philosophy 101, the only thing that I seem to remember from that class was that there is no airtight or unassailable argument for or against anything. I mean, I can't even stand up here before you and argue that I'm standing up here before you talking. Why? Because that pre 
presupposes that my mental faculties are sound and I know where I am in space and what I'm doing. Well, I can't prove to you that my mental faculties are sound. Do you see? There's holes that you can poke in everything. Now, for your sake, I hope my mental faculties are sound. But you can poke holes in anything. And this is why Paul did not say in verse 28, the religion we proclaim, the ideas we proclaim, the philosophy we preach. No, what he said was him whom we proclaim, whom we preach. You see, God didn't give us a philosophy. He gave us a person, an actual, real, flesh and blood, irrefutable, incontrovertible person. You guys, we don't proclaim a philosophy. We proclaim Jesus, a person who came and who lived among us, who lived like us, who died a death and rose again. That's what we're called to preach, a person. Jesus, to proclaim the gospel. We don't preach ideas, we preach a person. Let's look at warning and teaching. You looked at each of these at length in your homework this week, and I want to talk just a bit about them. Warning, according to the dictionary, is giving notice or advance danger, adv advice of danger, excuse me, impending evil or harm. And teaching is defined as imparting knowledge or skill or giving instruction. In. Now, according to Paul, both of these are important, and both of these must come into play. Uh, if we're going to present everyone mature in Christ, well, why is this? Because when we are warned of something, oftentimes our, our immediate reaction or what rises in our hearts is an immediate curiosity about what we've been warned about. You guys, I see this all the time with, with little kids, but if I'm being completely honest, I see it in my own heart as well. It's, it's the telling a three-year-old not to touch the stove, and immediately they're way more interested in the stove than they were three minutes ago right? I read a story one time by a woman who took her three young children, and she had three like under the age of five, and her whole family went to Australia on vacation. And she was, um, they were doing an outback tour with this like hardened outback guide. And she's like, so we're, we're marching through the outback, and the guide keeps doing things like this. Don't touch that! Stay away from that! And she's like, it was so disconcerting because he would just randomly blurt out, don't touch this. Stay away from this. And she's like, and while normally like that wouldn't bother me. Suddenly my six-year-old who's not given to touching random plants is suddenly like, why? You know, I mean, and is drawn to that very thing that he's been warned about. Guys, it's the same thing that rises in my heart when somebody's like, don't watch that movie. Don't listen to that song. Because I'm like, well, why? What's so bad about it? And I want to call it curiosity, but it has a much grosser name. It's rebellion. It's rebellion. And I suddenly find myself fighting this inexplicable pull to the very thing that I have been warned about. You guys, warning is important. Why? Because dangers are real. Dangers are real. But we must be taught why, and better yet, how to avoid them, or we are going to find ourselves in a mess of re re rebellion that has come out of our curiosity. Don't touch that stove, because it's hot and it will hurt you. Don't touch that plant, because apparently there's a plant in Australia that if you touch it, you'll be paralyzed for the rest of your life. I'm never going to Australia. Don't watch those movies. Don't listen to those songs. Why? Because they have images and messages that are going to dump garbage into your brain that will affect how you think and feel. You guys, we must be warned, but we must also be taught the two must go together. Proclaiming, warning, and teaching, it is the job of the body of Christ. It's what we are called to, and it's what's required if we're going to present everyone mature in Jesus, verse 28 says. So Jesus must be proclaimed. People must be warned of sin and hell. And people must be taught about the gospel, about scripture, about the counsel of God, about righteous living. Because maturity, ours and theirs, is what we're after. Before I move on to a fourth function, I want to address verse 29. Um, this is just a sweet little precious verse with a, a honey-in-our-mouths kind of truth that's contained in it. 
Verse 29 reads, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So situated in the middle of Paul's discourse on his jobs, his functions, his roles, his duty, is a reminder of who's actually doing the work. We forget so quickly that everything hinges on Jesus. And according to 1 Corinthians 15, 10, it's Christ's grace alone that is at work in believers who labor for Jesus. So any talk about function or duty or ministry has to be within the context of who's doing the work, Jesus. And it's his energy, his power. We don't wanna be tempted to claim it for ourselves. It's Christ alone. I love how Charles Spurgeon says it. He says it this way, there will never be any mighty work come from us unless there be a mighty work in us. No man truly labors for souls unless the Holy Ghost has first wrought mightily in him. You guys, we aren't alone in our work. We are very, very, very much dependent in our work. So let's lean into Jesus and submit ourselves to his energy and his power. Fourth function of Paul's ministry that he lists in this passage is found in Colossians 2, 1 through 3, and it reads, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul is struggling to see the, Col uh, the Colossians and the Laodiceans and us and anyone who hasn't seen him face to face. He's struggling to see their hearts encouraged and knit together in love. So what's the function here? It's to fight, it's to contend, it's to champion. Paul is being a gladiator because that word struggle or conflict in the King James actually comes from a Greek word that means an assembly that is met to see games. And it's the word that's used in describing the Olympics or the Greek national games. And in using this, Paul is communicating that there's a contest and there's Stakes. There's winners or losers and effort and training have to go into preparation. And you guys, there's pet spectators. And some are cheering and some are booing, but make no mistake, everyone is picking sides. Paul knows that there's stuff to be won and there's stuff to be lost. And it's the same for the church today. You guys, we must have the mentality of fighters, of contenders, because we are in a cosmic war, a cosmic contest, and the stakes are are high. I said it on the first week. Friends, we have to gear up. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 admonishes us to put on the armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. And finally, we're called to pray. Pray with all sorts of prayers and requests to pray continually, First Thessalonians says. And it's all right there in this text in Colossians, what we're supposed to pray for. Encouragement of heart, unity and love, and the reaching of the riches of full assurance of understanding. Understanding what? The mystery, Jesus. Friends, we must be gladiators. We must be fighters. If you are by nature a lover, great. Guess what? Jesus made you to be a fighter too. You get to do both. Let's take this call to fight, to struggle, Seriously, because it's his energy that works within us, right? It's not something we have to conjure up, but we're called to be fighters. Finally, function number five, chapter two, verse four of Colossians reads, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Paul's expressing something really sweet here. It is a heart of protection for the church. The function, bodyguard. Paul's being a bodyguard. Let's look at this word, these words, plausible arguments. Um, the dictionary defines plausible as having an appearance of truth or reason, seemingly worthy of approval or acceptance, well-spoken, and apparently worthy of confidence, but deceptively so. Plausible arguments are those arguments that appear one way, but underneath are meant to lead hearers in a different direction. You guys, this is exactly the tactic that the Gnostics were using through plausible arguments, arguments that sounded right or had an appearance of truth, the Gnostics were leading well-meaning believers astray into philosophies that degraded Jesus' Jesus's supremacy and would load down the believers with shame and guilt and ultimately nothing that would help them along in their faith. 
we face this again today. Everywhere we look, we will see plausible arguments. Plausible arguments against the existence of God. Plausible arguments defending and even encouraging immoral behavior. Plausible arguments asserting that the self is the single most important thing. Do you guys know what plausible arguments really are? They're lies. They are lies. And they are lies meant to have an appearance of the truth, but deceptively so. In the early 1990s, the pop singer George Michael came out with a song called, ironically called, Freedom. And there's a line in it that says, we have to take these lies and make them true somehow. You guys, that is a headlining bullet point on the resume, resume of Satan. Take these lies and make them true somehow so that we can, we, he, can lead people into all manner of bondage and slavery. Not freedom, like the gospel of George Michael says, but bondage and slavery. You guys, and we have to look no further than Genesis 1 through 3 to see what a plausible argument did to Adam and Eve. So what do we do? How do we identify a plausible argument so that we're protected from it? Well, first we do what Paul says to do in verses 1 through 3. We look to the Lord to encourage our hearts, to knit us together in his love, and to help us reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of Christ. In layman's terms, or rather Sarah speak, as a body, a church, we seek unity and love as we pursue the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We do not go rogue no man is an island, especially in Christianity, because Jesus and his kingdom contain all the treasure, all of it. Nothing else does. Community, the church functioning as a body in order to be diluted by plausible arguments. Second, in your homework, you looked up a few ways to judge the truth of a plausible argument. Consider the fruit. Does it line up with the teachings of scripture? Test everything. Does it acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh from God? If so, hold fast to it. If it doesn't, reject it. Reject it. And then look to the Holy Spirit, spirit of truth, to guide you into all truth. And finally, you read in your homework, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, which is essentially a long list describing the sin and behaviors of those in rebellion against God, basically describing the state of humanity today. And verse 5 says something super interesting. It describes some of the people in rebellion as having an appearance of godliness, but denying its power. The appearance. That's our plausible argument buzzword, appearance. The fruit denying its power. And this is key. Why? Because you guys, power, at least in Christianity, does a number of things. Some of which transforms us into Christ-likeness, right? It strengthens us for endurance and patience. It it performs miraculous and unexplainable acts like resurrection from the dead. And finally, it verifies that the message we carry is not of this world. In another one of Paul's letters, the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul says this in chapter 2, 1 through 5. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or, wis speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, people can fake a whole lot of things. They can look a certain way. They can talk a certain way. They can even not conjure up some crazy stuff that we can explain. We cannot explain. But nobody can fake the power of God. Nobody. And friends, any act or work or word of the Lord, even those he does through us, his pathetic vessels, are done with power. Transforming power, miraculous power, strong power, great and mighty power. And this power is what accomplishes the work. And without it, without this power, at best, there is just an appearance of godliness. And appearances are not that great. In fact, they're not good for anything because they are lies. 
Guys, we are called as a church to be protectors of the body together in community and unity and love to guard this body from the lies of the enemy. And if we are a people who operate through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's power, we're going to do just that. Let's be done with appearances and see the power of God. You guys, the final verse of this week's passage, Colossians 2.5 says this, For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith. I had you read this in the Amplified Version of Scripture. And the imagery in this is of the body of Christ standing firmly in an orderly array, shoulder to shoulder, solid and steadfast. Um, in medieval times, there was a warfare tactic called a shield wall. And this is what um, armies would use um, when they were advancing against each other. And basically what they would do is stand incredibly compact so that you couldn't even see light between their bodies. And they would have shields out in front of them and shields out over them. So this meant that as they advanced, they were protected from the front because their shields were here. They were protected from above because they had shields up here. And they were protected at the side by other people, squashed in tightly. The only exposed place was their backs. But that didn't matter because none of them ever planned on retreating. Because this is what the church is called to today. To stand tightly with shields out and above. Doesn't matter that our backs are exposed. Why? Because we are moving forward. We're taking ground. Fighting, contending, guarding, giving instruction, proclaiming, warning, teaching, and sometimes suffering. So that we can protect each other and gain ground from the enemy. I can think of no better goal for the church. I can think of nothing else I would rather be a part of. And the stakes are high, but the victory is won in the name of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 ends in these words. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So let's stand in good order, shoulder to shoulder in one body, making fully known the gospel of peace. Because our victory, the victory has been won. Let's pray. Jesus, we declare that the victory has been won in you and through you. And we praise you, our victor. Thank you, Lord, that we are no longer subject to the slavery and bondage of sin and death. That death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, Lord, we praise you. That we, through your son and his atoning work on the cross, can walk triumphantly into eternity as we worship the king forever. I pray that you would arm our hands for battle, that your power would fill us so that we advance and we take ground from the enemy. We pluck people from the gates of hell and make them part of your family. Lord, would you fill us with your very heart, with peace, with joy. And Lord, if the call is to endure suffering, that we would do so joyfully because it is for so Thank you, Lord, that you've chosen us, that you use us, and that you love us. We bless your name, Jesus. Amen. Next week, in your homework, you are going to be utilizing a Greek concordance. You've seen me do that in a number of your teachings, and it's now going to be your turn. So in your homework are instructions for how to do that on the internet where there's a free um a free website where you can look up things. Um, if you are interested in the paper version, if you're a paper girl, you just get yourself on Amazon and buy a Strong's Concordance. It weighs somewhere between 25 and 85 pounds, but it's, it's worth it. Um, but I'm excited for you guys because everyone can do this. So 
study hard. If you have questions, feel free to email. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, guys.